Hi, and thank you, and uh, thanks for having me in Lethbridge. Uh, Aaron, thanks for inviting me back. Uh, I had a great time here at the Briar. I'm from Alberta originally, so any chance to come back? I'll say yes. The people are great. The beef's much better than where I live, so I'm here. Uh, I had a great time when I was here at the Briar. I came home with a tremendous set of data from the stuff we're going to show you. Came back with some golf balls, branded tourism, that I've been actively promoting by scattering through the woods of every place I've golfed since being here. And I even brought COVID back from Lethbridge, which was great. So I think we're all past that. We won't use that word anymore, OK? That's, I think we all agree on that. I agree with everything Susan just said. I even actually put some of the same uh, information in my slides. So we're on the same page. I'm a huge fan of sports. I've been involved in sports my whole life, personally, professionally. That's what I know. That's what I do. I really got into sport tourism, I don't know, maybe about 10 years ago. Uh, I started working with Sport Tourism Canada, started doing research to really try to prove the benefits of sport tourism. You rewind the clock even a few years. It was such a new term. Not everyone really got it and understood it. Now, every municipality in this country pretty much has someone with the title sport tourism on a business card somewhere. Big cities, small towns, everyone in between is really starting to understand the impact of what sport and tourism can do for a community, for all the benefits that Susan just showed you, and then some. We could talk for hours on that subject, but that's not why we're here. But you can see it is the fastest growing sector, and at its core, pertaining to today's results, it's a grassroots economic development initiative. And whether you're at a small event, I was at my daughter's softball provincial championships two weeks ago in a small town, 16 girls teams and their accompanying families, and it raised hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in terms of economic impact for this small town in the middle of Vancouver Island. So it doesn't need to be a large national event like the Briar to be significant. It all adds up, it's all worthwhile, it all builds capacity and all these other great things. When I think of sport tourism, I think of it holistically. And I, these are the four pillars that I like to talk about when we're talking about impact. You know, economic, which we'll talk about here in a minute. The media and the marketing impact, which again is part of this. We'll show you some results because we measured that here around the Briar for Lethbridge as well. But then there's also the community and the social side of things. So the economic deals with the people that came from out of town, stayed here, enjoyed themselves and spent money while they were here, and then they went home. The community and the social side is a big part of it. 74% of the people that attended the Briar were from Alberta. 25% were from Lethbridge itself. People obviously thought, hey, this is a great event coming to my city. I want to be part of this. I'm going to come out and support it. And they did. Now, unfortunately, the money they're spending doesn't count because it's not new money coming into the local economy because that's the definition. But the civic pride of them saying, hey, Friends, family, come stay with me. We're hosting the Briar. It's a great event. You'll have a great time. I'll show you around my great town. So from a community social side, it's important too. With, in terms of the strategy, what events you want to bid on and host, what are the, what's the community going to support and get behind? Are they going to volunteer for that because it's something they love? All those type of things. And then last but not least, sustainability, which can include so many different things. If we're talking environmental, we're talking legacy, we're talking... So, you know, all these other things. Sustainability is a huge one and gaining a lot more popularity in sport hosting. Even when you look at the Olympics, they talk about sustainability of, we're going back to cities that have hosted Olympic Games before because the infrastructure to host the Games is so ginormous, it cripples economies and then these facilities never get used again because that's maybe not popular in their country, but they had to build a $30 million ski jump just to host it. So that's not a sustainable practice. And so the landscape globally is changing too. So just quickly on each of these pillars, as I said, economic, that's the financial impact of an event that can generate for a city, a region, a province, a country with new money coming into that economy. The media side, think of as your city as the brand and how your brand integrated into that event, whether it be through broadcast, whether it be through social media, and the reach that obtained for the event, and the dollar value that comes with all that publicity that you can't buy. The community, it's just what I said. It's the impact on the local population and in your community by hosting these events here. And the sustainability, as I said, there's a lot there, and we're not really going to touch on that because that's a topic unto itself. So specifically, the Briar. 
great event. Men's National Curling Championship. Huge TV ratings, huge following. People travel all over to, to come to the Briar. Not unlike the Grey Cup. Doesn't matter who's playing in the Grey Cup. People will travel. They'll go cheer on their team, even if their team doesn't have a chance of being in it. But it's a party, and it's an iconic Canadian event. I would put the Briar in that same category. So here's just a few highlights of what happened. You know, there was a cumulative attendance of almost 75,000 people walking through the gates here at the NMAC Center. There were 25 broadcasts on TSN and tons of coverage on repeat broadcasts throughout the evening, um, and they all got great ratings. The overall reach, 5.7 million people watched the Briar on television. Those are huge numbers. When we talk about the economic impact of the Briar, there's again, there's some big numbers here. There's a copy of the executive summary to the report that, as Susan said, is being made public here in a couple weeks where all the details are in it. I will not bore you with all of that because that is not fair to anybody. But a couple of the highlights. Um, first, just how it works. You know, it's, it's a positive change in the economic activity resulting specifically by hosting that event. And it's the new money coming into the economy specifically because of that event. Locals don't count. That's just a repurposing of spending. So when we're actually trying to figure out this, to come up with all these numbers, we have to go and get figures from all these different groups you see here on the left-hand side. So from the visitors, that's the participants, the spectators, the media, the VIP, everyone that came to town for that event. You add in all the operational costs that it took to put this event on, all the advertising, the staff salaries, the promotion of the materials, the renting of equipment, fencing, porta potties, whatever it might be. And then for certain events, there's capital expenditures required. You happen to have a fabulous facility that's just perfectly suited to host an event like the Briar. If you wanted to host a cycling event in a velodrome, I don't know if there's a cycling velodrome in Lethbridge, you would have to build one, hence a capital expenditure cost, but that's not applicable to this study. So what we actually did, how many people saw us out here, and you can see the photo and some of the team members here, uh, helped us. We were setting up these kiosks, and we had people walking around the concourses and into the stand. How many people were, saw a survey or an intercept going on that were here at the Briar? How many people were at the Briar, first of all? Okay, so but half the people that were here saw what was going on. The rest of you must not like curling. I don't know why you weren't here. It was a great event. But we set up these kiosks on the concourse, and we had this great table of Lethbridge swag and oaky pins and little stress rocks and sleeves of golf balls that I told you I've lost all of mine already to hand out to people to say thank you for filling in this little survey for us. And I think there was a chance to win some gift cards at the end or something. And so you provide that incentive, people were more than happy to give us five minutes of their time, answer all the questions that we had needed for this study. And it worked out great. I mean, we were busy the whole time. We had great sets of volunteers, both from the council, from Tourism Lethbridge, and I think a few others. So thank you to all the volunteers. Oops, I'm going backwards. So in terms of the spending, you know, there was, I think, a total of, uh, oh, I forgot how many people were here. There's about 17,000 people from out of town that descended on, 18,500, according to my report here, that, <laughs> that came from out of town to stay in Lethbridge. They stayed an average of five nights in Lethbridge. They spent an average of $1,200 per party. When we added that up, that party size over those days, Ten and a half million dollars of direct expenditures going to local businesses, hotels, restaurants, gas stations, taxi companies, buying merchandise, buying clothing, going to a drugstore, whatever it might be. That's $10.5 million directly spent here from spectators. The other 350000 is from the media, the VIPs, the athletes themselves, some delegates from curling, etc. So when you add all that up, $10.8 million layered in with the operational expenditures that Curling Canada and the local committees spent to actually put the event on, another 2.4. Overall, $13.2 million of direct spending happening right here. That is a big number in my opinion. <clears throat> yeah. And so when you mention you haven't done a STEAM Pro before, and STEAM stands for Sport Tourism Economic Assessment Model, in case anyone was wondering, 
we're using real facts and figures to measure this. And a lot of times it's done as a return on investment analysis. So other than the people that are really in the know, does anyone know what it cost to, have, to bid on the briar, to bring the briar to bed, what the hosting fee is? Does anyone know what that number is? Well, well council does, yeah, because you guys have to approve it. You have to shell out this money. So other than Mr. 64 over here, does anyone know the answer? Take a guess. Oh, I don't need guess. Okay. So the number is? A million dollars. So this city put up a million dollars just to bring the event here, hoping there would... Uh-oh. Angry support on its way. Did I do something? Well, as, the, as our tech support is taking care of this, that I probably screwed up, um, that's a fabulous return on investment. So you're putting up a million dollars hoping they will come. What's that, Field of Dreams? Uh, you build it, they will come. $13 million in return? I would take that return on investment any day. And it's more than just the direct expenditure at that time. You know, there's an indirect impact and an induced impact that occurs because of this spending. And the simple analogy of that is, imagine you're going for dinner, and you have a nice dinner, it costs you $100. That's the direct expenditures that happen there that evening. Well, the indirect expenditures is that restaurant had to buy the food, launder the linens, you know, wash the cutlery, pay their staff to make your meal possible. Those are all indirect costs to support the direct expenditure. The induced impacts are, all right, I had a great meal, I tipped my server. Hopefully everyone else did as well. The server grabbed up all their tips. Maybe they went out that night and had some dinner or drinks themselves, saved up and bought themselves some shoes at the local shoe company. That's the repurposing of that same dollar that was only made available because of hosting that event. So it's the ripple effect of that money's going through the economy for days, months, and sometimes years to come. So, the 13 million I showed you was just the direct expenditures. When you layer in all these things and add it all up, it was about 20 million dollars in the province. Oh, it's coming back. Is that where I was? That is where I was. Excellent. So, you know, here's some of the facts and figures you see in this little summary. You know, because we calculate, as I showed you in that chart, how it works. The outputs are in terms of GDP, which is the net income that is created here. Wages, salaries, job creation, job support, taxes at all level of government. All that gets added up and the numbers are tremendous. And when the full report comes out, feel free to read through it if you need some good sleeping material. Uh, and all these numbers are explained in there. But in all these different areas, they're tremendous figures. Again, just from hosting an event here for a week in Lethbridge. So I think they're great numbers. Any questions about the economic before I move on to the media? And again, the full report's coming out shortly. But anything about what I just talked about? Excellent. Either it's self-explanatory or I've already bored you all to sleep. <laughs> <clears throat> when we decided to take on the economic impact, curling gets a ton of exposure. Canadians love curling. The broadcast numbers I showed you on TSN, the media reach every day in the paper, social media, etc. We decided, well, let's measure the media impact here as well. So here's a quick summary of the numbers from a media perspective, specifically associated with Lethbridge and the Briar. So print online, 5,600 stories from over 300 different sources. That's tremendous. AEV at the end stands for Advertising Equivalency Value. And so how that number gets calculated, that if you were going to buy the same amount of space in that publication where that story showed up, that's how much it would cost. So when they add up all together, these are the numbers. And again, they're huge numbers. Social media, tw almost 2,500 different people decided to post something about the Briar in Lethbridge. You know, and there was a total of almost 6,600 posts. Again, a huge reach in terms of all these people's social networks and how far reaching that message goes. And most of it was very, very, very positive, of course. And the AEV just unfortunately isn't as high because it's cheaper to buy an ad on Facebook than it is in the Toronto Sun, as an example. There was TSN ads that ran at every draw. So I think, uh, I think the city was given one per draw, if I'm not mistaken. 
And you know, the 30 second spot rate of an ad generated it to that 5.7 million audience for another $35,000 in media value by running those ads. The broadcast exposure are the assets that Lethbridge and Oki were given that showed up in broadcast, like in ice branding as an example. Again, big numbers, almost $25 million in media exposure you would have had to pay to get the same coverage and publicity. Here's just a little more detail in terms of like some of the reach and the sentiment, right? And so we measure the content. Now most news sentiment is neutral. It's just a factual story. Hey, the Briar's happening here in Lethbridge and Brad Goosh was likely to win it, blah, blah, blah. So the sentiment is neutral. You would have to really write positive descriptors or something nasty negative to it show up as, as negative. And you can see we're talking like print online, like 0 0.3. Social media, 9%. That could be someone saying, I'm at the Briar and I'm waiting too long to get my curly fries. That's deemed as negative. So take that with a grain of salt. It was very, very positive all the way through and we analyzed everything. Here's some samples. These were just different news clips that we pulled out from publications of all different size from literally all foreigners of the country. The, the salt wire in Cape Breton Island, they were your biggest supporter. I think they posted like 131 stories about the briar. Go Cape Breton. Uh, I'm an honorary Cape Bretoner, by the way. Uh, but you can see the stories from all, like from the Winnipeg Sun, local media, et cetera. It was so far reaching, it was incredible. Um, there was even a news story on Global News. Yeah, that was a good little interview by, you know, your own Aaron Crane. That was worth $102,000 in terms of media value. You would have to pay to get that. There's also the social side. So again, posts from the athletes themselves traveling to Lethbridge, people here having a great time. Uh, you know, the crew on the ice to, you know, fans all over the place to the, to the uh, owned media that the city of Lethbridge and tourism Lethbridge were posting to encourage it and to support it. So again, from so many different circles, ton of positive media. When I talked about the other exposure, these were some of the other examples that appeared in broadcast. So the city of Lethbridge and Oki were the in-ice logos that were seen on every shot, on every draw, because that's how the camera follows the curling rock up and down the ice, to some of the vignettes that were run, or the scenery, what I call postcards. So at every intro of every broadcast and going to commercial, the camera would pan out. There was a ton of exposure to the high-level bridge. There was a few other areas that they were setting up shop. And so your city and its attractions, its skyline, it, whatever it is, is part of the broadcast. Consider that tourism advertising, if you would. Even things like the media backdrop, where all the athletes would stand to get their stuff done, standing in front of a City of Lethbridge sign. So these are just some examples of the different forms of media integration that your brand as a city garnered from this event. Any questions on media before I jump into the last few things here? OK, great. So sport tourism strategy. I'm really pleased of where Lethbridge is. And with, with Susan, with Aaron, Bill, who I've spoken a lot with, with council that I've presented at before and is represented here, and the different stakeholders in the community and the entire sport community agreeing to come together for things like this. I think this is a great jumping off point on, hey, we've done some great things, but how can we be better? How can we improve upon this? How can we take advantage of this legacy and a bunch of the other great events we've hosted for the future? And so I always say, you know, like, what do you want to be when you grow up, Lethbridge? Like, where are you now? And what do you want to be in the future? What does your sport tourism strategy have in mind? Total world domination. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> you know, you're probably set right now. And this is where I'll start talking about capacity building, which I know Aaron's going to jump into here in a minute. But to lead into it, assessing what you have. What venues do you have? What could we host with our existing infrastructure? What technical resources do we possess in town? What's the knowledge base of the people in this room and in the wider community? What's our volunteer base like? Do we have a database of that? Do we know how many people we could get out to volunteer at an event that needs 600 volunteers to be successful? How can we build that volunteer base? 
How can we build on things like transportation? As an example, I flew in from Vancouver. It was pretty hard to get a flight that worked directly in the Lethbridge. So I figured, oh, easy. I'll fly into Calgary, I'll rent a car and drive up. Rental cars were $2,400 for two and a half days. That's not feasible. I tried to take a bus. The Red Arrow doesn't run on Wednesdays between Calgary and Lethbridge. I'm only telling you this because when you're doing your assessment and your capacity, you're going to need to be honest with yourselves and there's going to be a lot of things that fall on the positive side of the ledger and there's going to be some things on the negative side of the ledger. And these will give you things to work on. There's always going to be a solution. I mean, there was a great car service that brought me here from Calgary today and it worked out fabulous. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> but these are things you're going to need to think about when you're bringing in people and expecting tens of thousands of people to come to your city. You're going to have to come up with solutions for anything that appears on maybe that other side of the ledger, right? And so these are hopefully going to be some of the exercises you're having as a community in the days, months, years to come to figure out where are we now and where do we want to be when we grow up. And there's a lot of options, there's a lot of paths you can take, but the alignment that I see here in Lethbridge between the stakeholders I mentioned and then some, you guys are ahead of the curve. Whether it feels like it to you or not, you're ahead of the curve. We talk to communities all over the country. We get asked to provide sport tourism strategy, to do different projects for them. And it's amazing how discombobulated other communities are in this country. They see the benefit of sport tourism, because some of those numbers we just showed, those are pretty big. That's a great return on investment. Everyone wants to be part of it. Everyone is going to be bidding against you to host that same event. What's going to make your hosting that event and your community stand out to win more of those bids, to be successful, to have these kind of returns, and to build and grow your capacity to be what you want to be when you grow up? So I'm going to leave you with that to think about. You're not going to be able to answer it today, but this is the work that you as a community, as a sport tourism community, are hopefully going to be doing so that hopefully I'm here enjoying more events in the future. So congratulations and good luck at the same time. Thanks for having me. Oh, oh, I forgot, there's another slide. There's another slide. I'm gonna leave you with this roadmap too. And Aaron, this is your roadmap. And this is something that was developed by Sport Tourism Canada to help both the bidding for a host city and a sport organization. And so this is a successful cycle that we're using as the gold standard to start building your template around. And this can build business, community, and all the local sport along with some of those economic numbers. But if it's going to be strategic, you got to plan it, you got to deliver it, and you got to evaluate it. I'm a huge measurement guy. I believe there's a measurement tool for anything out there. So if, whenever you're planning, you want to also build a measurement plan, an evaluation plan. Figure it out it is what you're going to measure, how you're going to measure it, and then hopefully you're measuring it consistently over time to see if you are moving up that ladder, if you would. So you set your objectives and measure against it. I'm such a huge believer in it. It's the only way you're going to know if that roadmap you just saw is working and successful. And I'm sure you guys will reap the benefits because of that if you follow some of these steps and the stuff I know you're going to be working on. So now I'll say thank you. And if you have any questions, let me know. You just wanted to apply. All right, all right, all right, all right, OK. So any questions before I hand this off to your CEO of Tourism, Aaron Crane? How much does uh, Tim Horton pay to be the sponsor of the Triumph? Well, Tim Hortons has been a longtime sponsor of Curling Canada. And I don't know the exact number they pay, but it's a big chunk because a lot of my work is around sports sponsorship, is a lot of the work I do. And so we'll evaluate those opportunities for a brand like Tim Hortons. They have their own agency, but otherwise they could come to groups like mine saying, hey, Curling Canada is asking us for X million dollars over the next eight years. Is it worth it or not? And then we would look at all these opportunities, add them up and tell them yes or no. So I don't know their exact number. I don't know if that number was ever made public, but it's huge for something like that, because they do a lot within curling. But everyone, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't see some changes with a lot of sponsorships, whether it be Tim Horton specifically, or a lot of others. 
The world has been turned upside down the last few years, as we all know. Some businesses did great, some not as well. And I think you're going to see a lot of changes in sponsorship, whether it's issues like Hockey Canada, which is incredibly unfortunate that sponsors are dropping out of that, whether it's financial, whether it's a change of their strategic goals, I think that's a big shakeup for the sponsorship landscape. So that's a very long answer for a question I didn't have the answer to, but <laughs> it's a lot of money. <laughs> Otherwise, Aaron Crane. All right. Thank you.